Conrad and Joey and the rest of Selma for being as open-minded as you were to invite me to talk about naturalism, most of which you, I'm sure you haven't heard of. I hope by the end of the talk you'll consider yourself a naturalist, um, in the mm -hmm. sense that I'm going to explain today. Now, if there's, uh, again, you can hear me okay? Fine. Not really? How's this? Okay, now we're getting some amplification. All right, I'll stand conveniently next to the podium for the duration. <laughs> stand away by own slides. That's, that's always helpful. <laughs> um, but if there's something more delicate and difficult to discuss than sex, what could it be? Politics. <laughs> People raise their hands quite readily on matters of sexuality. Who will dare to identify themselves as a conservative, would you please raise your hand? What is it? <laughs> mm. <laughs> Just, well, okay, now who would identify themselves as, say, a progressive or liberal? Yeah, what is you? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. <laughs> okay, terrific. No moderate? So, today's crowd is going to be a very easy yeah, to stare at. Yeah, I think it's going to be a First thing we're going to do today is build a worldview. Most of you probably have a worldview, but it's not particularly explicit, right? So we're going to build you one today. It's going to be called naturalism, worldview naturalism. All right. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to, after we build an African up to a certain extent, we're going to challenge libertarian free will. Something that many of you might think you have, but you don't. Aww. Next, we're going to talk about what I think of the progressive implications of naturalism. And we're going to look at social policy and personal applications coming out of those implications, out of, out of world view naturalism. Then we're going to talk very briefly about existential concerns, the kinds of concerns that religions are usually uh, deal with. I, I can just I'll just lean casually on the This is my And then I will admit that nationalism, like all worldviews, including religions, doesn't have answers to all the questions. There are tough questions that nationalism has to deal with, that we have to deal with, but our worldview really can't solve for us. So I don't want to claim too much for nationalism. All right, let's build our worldview. <coughs> What is a worldview? Again, you may not have one, you may not even need one. If you don't, that's fine. I'm not trying to sell you anything too much. A worldview is the big picture of reality and human nature that puts things in an ultimate context, a cognitive tool that makes sense of our situation and helps guide behavior both morally and practically. So that's an idea of what a worldview is. I think there are six questions that a worldview has to answer, at least six. These are the basics, the basic elements of the world. How do you know what's real? That's our epistemology. By the way, I should say that this is going to be a little bit philosophical compared to our last talk, so bear with me. A little bit of a calm down, I'll do what I can to spice it up, but know that <laughs> your minds are going to be, I hope, stretched a bit. Okay, how do we know what's real? That's our epistemology. What exists? That's our metaphysics. Who are we, essentially? That's the question of human nature and human agency. More of the three other <coughs> questions we have to answer are the following. How ought we behave? That's ethics. How can we best solve our problems? Those are the practical applications. What is it all about? Those are our existential concerns. Now, I would like to say that atheism is not a worldview nor is reason a worldview. Atheism is the denial of God. Reason is a, a tool, reason of, of cognition, of logic, of evidence. But let's face it, people use reason all the time to reach false conclusions starting from bad premises.
could you many who subscribe to religious worldviews? Christianity, Buddhism, Islam are worldviews, of course. They tell you what exists, who you are, what the meaning of life is, how you should behave. And they also offer practical solutions in life. So what I'm doing today, what I'd like to suggest, is an alternative, alternative naturalistic worldview, worldview naturalism, which says, here's, here's the basics. Nature is what there is, and nature is enough. That's naturalism in a nutshell. And the Center for Naturalism has developed a little tagline. It is as follows. Connection, compassion, and control. The three C's. And you'll see how these are developed as we deal with the world. So here's what we'll do naturalism I'm answering the six questions just in a, in, in a quick series of the details will come up shortly. Our epistemology is empiricism. That means using the public evidence the way that science uses it. Our metaphysics is nature. Nature is what exists. There's no evidence for the supernatural. Human nature. Who are we? We are evolved physical creatures completely within nature. That's our connection. That's the connection of the three seas. We're connected to nature completely, causally connected. Our ethics is progressive, humanistic, and egalitarian. The talk title was From Empiricism to Equality, right? A grandiose title, but I think a case would be made for this. So that's where compassion comes in, because of our progressive implications of naturalism, as we'll talk about for the show. The practical applications are based on a causal understanding of ourselves, of our human behavior. That gives us control. So we have connection to the to the natural world, we have compassion, and we have control. And the existential concerns, the answer to the question of what is it all about, has to do with living in a wild universe, an unsupervised universe in which there's no God in charge, as Daryl said, no sky God looking down and supervising things. Okay, so a little bit about epistemology and empiricism. How do we know what we know? That's the question. Well, we know that personal experience, intuition, and faith are pretty unreliable when it comes to deciding matters of fact. So we have, we have to use public evidence, in principle, available to anyone, anyone sitting here, to decide what's the case, what's true. And this we call empiricism. That's what science generally does, it's observation, right? Get your telescope, microscope, the naked eye. You observe. That's how facts are decided, even if the object of observation is considerably far away or very, very tiny. Take the example of alien abduction. How many have been alien abducted? <laughs> that was him. Well, all right. How do we know it's true you were abducted? Let's not just claim you have this experience. How do, you, how do we know you were right? Well, clearly, we can't just trust your experience. We would need to see some physical evidence, some corroboration of your experience. Your experience might be completely vivid and real to you, but we wouldn't believe you unless you give us some public evidence, intersubjective evidence, some empirical evidence, attesting to the fact that it actually happened, right? Okay, I hope this is obvious to everybody. This is basically science and a science-based discipline that asks us to be from Missouri. You know the, the model of Missouri? The show me state. <laughs> so be from, I mean, from Kansas, but you can also be from Missouri. We should Damn, watch the empiricists, that is, use public evidence, exemplified by science, in deciding any question of fact. Science and empiricism, this is a strong claim, have no rivals in giving us reliable factual knowledge. There's just no other way of knowing about the world that can hold candle to empiricism when it comes to deciding what's true. If you want to stake your life on something, you stick with public evidence, no matter, no matter what's, what the question is. There are no, there's no factual domain in which faith, intuition, or tradition has special expertise or rationale or credibility. For instance, the nature of reality or the existence of God. Faith, tradition, and intuition have no special credibility or authority in any factual domain. They, they just can't compete with empiricism. There's nobody I know of in which I would look to faith, tradition, or intuition, gut feelings, as opposed to science. Just tell me what the case is. 
On the assumption that we want reliable knowledge, we are rational to the empiricists. Hope that's, hope we're all getting into the empiricism ship here, as I speak. I think you're already there. But this is where it is, reason does come into play. If you want reliable knowledge, on that assumption, it's rational to be an empiricist. So, to be an empiricist is also to be epistemically responsible. If you do not use public evidence and decide what's true in your beliefs, you're really putting other people at risk. It's unethical to base your beliefs on anything but public evidence, especially when it comes to matters of consequence, for instance, climate change, or vaccinations, or birth control, or what causes HIV. Faith and tradition will let you down every time. And it's, it's unethical, it's irresponsible to deal with anything but public evidence when deciding great, these great matters of fact. Our metaphysics, turning up the question of what exists. Well, signs of empiricism provide evidence for the natural world, for nature. A single, causally interconnected realm of existence. That's what science shows to exist, and we're all part of it. There's no reliable evidence on the other hand for any, anything supernatural. Gods, ghosts, souls. There's no reason to suppose they exist if you stick with evidence. If you don't, then it goes, right? The feeling that you might have a soul will probably, if you've been brought up in a religious tradition, very well might trump the lack of evidence on the scientific understanding for, say, the soul or God. Here's an important point. Not point. Nothing supernatural plays a role in any evidence-based explanation or scientific theory. You won't find anything spooky or supernatural going on in science or in any other evidence-based discipline like the law. You might find it in dowsing, right? Or uh, prayer, hopes and, and intuitions and wishes, hoping that there's something supernatural playing a role in how things work. But if we're an empiricist, uh -oh. if I get the wrong button, if you're an empiricist, if I'll uh, we try to get this back online, you'll agree that there's nothing supernatural that plays a role in uh, how we call the world you know. Meanwhile, I have brought with me some a paper copy of my talk, which I will get and continue to regale you with. <laughs>